Welcome to another episode of the Reboot Chronicles, a no holds barred forum with global leaders, authors, entrepreneurs, and CEOs about how organizations stay focused on growth and innovation in unprecedented times. I'm your host, Dean DeBias, coming to you live from Revive's North American headquarters in Chicago, and we would like to thank you for joining us from around the globe today. I'd like to welcome Bracken Darrell to the program today. He's the CEO of Logitech. Welcome, Bracken, from Silicon Valley today. It's good to see you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Yeah. I, uh, I'm a fan of your company. It's a, got a really interesting background. You guys are a $3 billion electronics company with a wide range of products that, quite frankly, most of us are using right now at home and some of you that are lucky enough to be in the office. Those of you that don't know, they're headquartered in Switzerland, obviously major operations in Silicon Valley, and has become a multi-brand company that is designing products that bring people together through music, games, video, computing, streaming, and of course the ever more present working at home movement, which we'll talk about. So I think through a series of smart developments that I've seen and acquisitions, Bracken and his team have delivered double digit growth consecutively over the last five years as he's rebooted the company. And with their 2021 fiscal really just getting underway and the at home global lockdown going on still and a continuing work at home or work from ever trend going on, I think this is really a great company to watch. So Bracken, uh, welcome to the program. And uh, I thought I thought we'd talk about you know learning from home today and how remote working and technology uh, is kind of rebooting the way we work, the way we play, the way we shop, which most people um, don't really get into too much. But I thought first let's back up and maybe just start with a little overview of the business. Tell us about Logitech for those that might not be totally familiar. Yeah, I think most people know us as uh, as the the company that all started with a mouse, which we are. Well, we the other one. Disney, of course, is the one they normally think of. But we uh, we've been around since 1981. We're we're uh, you know almost almost a 40 year old company. Wow. And when I joined the company eight years ago, we were in uh, primary PC primarily PC peripherals, and then we started serially going into new things. And we're now in uh, really 30 different categories with five different brands. So we're in everything from video conferencing equipment, which I'm using right now, uh, and you're using one of our microphones, to yeah. uh, gaming Blue. equipment and music, as you said, Bluetooth speakers and uh, we make we actually own Streamlabs, which is a streaming platform that you can use to stream onto Twitch and make money if you're a streamer. So, it's a it's a super broad, diverse business, uh, but it still feels like a small company, like it probably did back in the '80s. Yeah, yeah, you're uh, you're very humble in your overviews. Um, most people don't know that you came in and, like many of the visitors on this program, you you rebooted Logitech. It was. It was struggling at the time, I think. I mean, any company that's been along that, been around that long is always going to have different needs and, and, and ways it needs to grow and therefore new leadership. So tell us about your reboot. I think it doesn't get enough coverage. Okay. Well, we, uh, when I came in, the company was valued at about a billion dollars. Um, uh, it, was, it was in decline. And I, I came in and I had an immediate impact. The, the company declined faster, had, had the worst loss in, in its history after my first year. So I really rebooted just the right way. Um, and from yeah. there, from there, we really we re, we rebooted using design as our focus. So we we uh, my goal was really to try to become a design company, which is the way I still think about us. So we we I hired my first designer about a year in. I started getting directly involved. You're a product person. I'm a product person. So I got very directly involved in products from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And we started to slowly uh, change almost everything um, and, and still keep the, the chassis of this small, hungry company that started, you know, back in, in 1981. And we went from that billion dollar company today, you know, worth somewhere between nine and 10 billion. So it's a nine or 900 percent return for investors who got in right at the beginning. And, uh, and the cool thing is we're just we're still at the, the early stages. You know, we've taken design from from what I call stage one design, which is making things look good to stage two design, which is building the product around the user. And now we're headed into stage three, which is turning design inward and, and redesigning everything inside while we're continuing to improve our, product, improve our products on the outside. So a lot going on. We've, we've entered a lot of new categories. We're now in 30 different categories compared to the, the four or five we started with. Um, and we're just getting started. 30 categories, almost 30 years coming up here. Wow. Um, 40. Or I'm sorry, 40. Do the math. <laughs> that actually is amazing, especially for a Silicon Valley company and um, or Silicon Valley Swiss. Uh, yeah. The uh, so let's 
fast forward now to 2020, it's been a little different. A lot of companies have kind of suffered. Um, I assume, you know, with the, this massive shift to work from home and lead from home, which is something that people are trying to do and struggling with. So there's a whole leadership track here that so uh, we can ask you about in a bit. But what's been the impact on Logitech? I assume it's better than uh, some of the retailers that had to close. You guys have maybe had a opposite effect. Yeah, we were. We our business is driven off of four uh, four big long term trends or secular trends. Uh, the first one is video everywhere. You know, you you know, it used to be you'd go into a meeting space and there'd be a phone on it, and right. increasingly there's an, there's video, and so we're we're video enabling those rooms. We're bigger now than any other company in that, than bigger than Cisco and Polycom, and or which is now Poly. So okay. we're we're a big player in that. The second uh, big trend is esports. You know, we. Well, we got in pretty early in the in the rise of esports back in when I first came. We should a student body left and put as many people as we could on it because I had kids who were serious gamers and they told me, "Dad, get with the picture, man. You guys have a great brand, but no products that make sense." And and, uh, and we started investing. So that's that secular trend is going to continue. You know, esports will be part of the Olympics, I suspect, and in, in, uh, in over the next few uh, next you know four or five, six, seven, eight years. And then the third uh, big trend is is working from anywhere. You know, which, as you mentioned, during the pandemic has gotten a shot in the arm, but it was already on the way up. And then the last one is streaming and creating, like, like in a way, like we're doing now. I mean, right. But the democratization of, of streamers has opened up new categories for us, and all those are are trends that were that that, are, that give us different categories of opportunity, and we've just entered more and more categories across all of them. So kind of sticking with the uh, the times that we're in, your company has done a few things to, to kind of pitch in and help out and I guess give back would be a better word around the globe. What, uh, what, what have you actually done? Well, we've done a lot. You know, we're, we're in the wonderful spot where our products actually became more relevant during this period when uh, COVID-19 really kicked in. So, you know, we make cameras that, that we're, we've given a lot of cameras to teachers and, and hospitals uh, doctors connecting to patients inside the hospital. Uh, you know, some we, we, we've created a cart where where actually the healthcare workers don't have to go into the COVID nineteen infected rooms. I saw so, that. Yes, on wheels. We, so it's a little. Tell us about that one. Yeah, it's it's a it's pretty basic. You know, it's really a very nice uh, webcam. You know, with it's set up on a cart, and what that enables people they can wheel one in there so that the patient can see the their their the doctor or and connect to their family on the outside. You know, it's a, it's such a tragic period for so many people, but you certainly want to be able to connect with those you love. So we've done that. We've also, um, we've rolled out a program where we connect teachers to students, you know, overnight, you know, every teacher became a, a virtual teacher and they needed a good camera. And so we, we've, we did 12 or 15,000 at this point, um, headsets and, and webcams so that they could do that. And and then we've wow. just been all over the all over the world. We've had our own people going out trying to do good, good stuff. Whether it's donating cameras or helping people, you know, it's been a uh, in a way the most important period in our company's history from the standpoint of really connecting people to other people. Yeah, that's a big commitment. I mean, giving away free hardware is a lot different from digital companies providing extra cloud space and this and that. Um, that's that's that's. Um, all they needed uh, on top of that was someone to help them kind of figure out the, the curriculum and the new environment and the, uh, yeah. the coaching and the training. It sounds like a lot of your employees kind of jumped in there too, which is, which is fascinating. You've got a global footprint too, which is very helpful. Sure. What, um, so just kind of looking ahead, the, um, maybe what we talk about a lot in the program is kind of growth and innovation and the governance around it. So, um, without getting too into the weeds, I'd love to hear your strategy a little bit, whether it's the past or maybe we'll talk a little bit about the future at the end. When you look at developing new products and services, so your design thinking, you're, you're bringing that more into a common structure of the company. Um, so three things that I usually talk about in the reboot series is, you know, build by borrow. So are you building some of your own technology? Obviously you are. Are you buying it and acquiring? You've done some really good jobs. So I think acquiring companies like uh, Astro Gaming, Streamlabs, Ultimate Ears, Jaybird, and of course, Blue, this thing here. Yeah. Uh, quite frankly, quite I think you've been one of the smartest acquirers out there, not overpaying for stuff as well. And then the last one uh, is the build by borrow. So borrowing, you know, partnering with other companies to kind of accelerate innovation. So I'm just curious how, how that mixes together in terms of your product roadmap and how your people approach growth and innovation. Well, I'll start by by saying, you know, we we uh, before I get into build by borrow, we uh, I'll talk about how we how we 
how we structure ourselves. So um, I spent my whole career in big companies, you know, and and I I learned one thing in there, which is I don't want to do anything like a big company. Big companies have only one advantage over a good startup, and that's scale. And of course, scale is a huge advantage. So it it plays out in many different ways. But everything else is a disadvantage, the bureaucracy, the hierarchy, the slowness, you know, so so I didn't want to be like that. So what we've tried to do is um, one of the reasons why we have 30 different businesses now is we've I feel like a, uh, the, the chief rock breaker, you know, as we grow, I keep breaking these teams into smaller pieces. So we're now yeah. we've gone from, you know, four to 30, we'll probably one day be 50 or 100. And, and so what that's done is it's given us these small teams with a lot of ownership and accountability for what they're doing. As part of that, early on, we created the, this concept, which is very, very technically difficult. Let me let me take a minute and try to explain it. I wish I had a whiteboard. It's called trees, plants and seeds. <laughs> It's like hard. It. <laughs> so the tree is the big old core business that is, you know, slows down and is healthy, but but it's uh, it's not going to grow really fast. Mm-hmm. The plants are fast growing existing businesses you can pour fertilizer into, and they grow even faster. And so we we had those businesses we identified very early, and the seeds are exactly what they sound like. They're these new startups. It's the re- it's your whole series. They're these new startups that internally that we. We create, and so we started that, you know, literally from the first year that I was here, and we've been serially doing this ever since. So, and, and in the seeds, we've actually brought in a lot of entrepreneurs into the company to help build them and create them, and we even have a different compensation structure for some of them, where it makes sense. So, right. that's been probably the the structural difference between us and a lot of other companies. We really, this isn't rhetoric; this is real. And it's it's uh, made a big difference for us. And we have, you know, of our seed, I have between or we have between five and, and 15 seeds at a time in development. And a lot of them never make it out of the gate. And if they don't, we give everybody a bonus. and We move on to something else. Um, but it's, many of them do, you know, and, and, and you know, really the, our first seed was probably our video conferencing business, which today is a, a over 400 million dollar business. And it's grown, you know, it grew, you know, 60 percent last quarter. So it's it's on fire. I bet no. Polycom, and, Polycom and Cisco didn't see that one coming. They didn't think you'd act like a startup and come up with something totally different and unique. And that's both a services and a hardware business, really, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's becoming a service and a hardware business. It's really a hardware. It was a hardware business first. You know, I don't know if they didn't see it coming or that it was so small that they didn't care. You know, and, and I no, they didn't see that. you coming. Is what I meant. <laughs> I don't know about that. I, they didn't I, say uh, the brack and train coming. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I think I think at the end of the day, the um, the reason we got into that business is, you know, this is this is what great entrepreneurs uh, do, and we were, and we, we were many great entrepreneurs, not all, but they follow the the customer, and so the customer was taking our webcams, putting. I was I, I went into several um, early on. I went into several uh, small small startups offices, and they'd have their 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 big conference room or boardroom was a TV on the wall and a webcam on top of it. And they hook their computer up to it, and there you go. That was it. And they do all their conference calls that way on this new thing called a USB connection. And so we said, gosh, we can do a better camera and microphone than that. So we made a little bit bigger one that looked a little like Wally, and you know, the cartoon. And oh, yeah. uh, and that one did pretty well. That was that was about a. It became like a six or seven million dollar business for us. And we thought we can do better than that. And then we and then we can do better than that. And and Wally is still out there. We call it Orbit Ali internally. Uh, but we've got now we can do all the way up to boardrooms and, and large rooms, larger rooms, medium sized rooms, anything. I like that because it's it, it was very cumbersome equipment back in the video conferencing days with telepresence. Cisco tried to make it yeah. better, but it was still massive investment. And you've kind of it's almost like the democratization of this equipment and made things smaller and cheaper and better and more plug and play. So I would always find I needed a guy or a girl or someone to come and help me get all that yeah. equipment going. In the old yep. video conference, especially in the boardrooms, you'd be like, "Oh no, it's not working." They always call <laughs> someone. <laughs> so, That's so funny. now we work at home. I don't see a lid on this thing. I mean, this is uh, unlimited growth potential. It seems like. Yeah, I, I really agree with that. You know, you you described the scenario that we actually have a, a piece of advertising. We don't do a lot of advertising, but we have a really cute piece of advertising called Tap Logitech Tap <laughs> Advertising. You just put the put that in the in, in Google, and you'll you'll see or YouTube, and you'll see this. But it describes exactly what you're talking about. In this case, uh, the IT department is, a, is, a, is literally tap dancing on the table. But it's a, <laughs> but it's a hilarious commercial. It's wonderful. But it is exactly that. You know, the, the cool thing about uh, the tech that we're working in is you usually don't need anybody. I mean, the IT departments love it because they can, they can distribute and track where all the devices are and how much time they're being used. And, 
even you know one day soon probably how many people are using those, those rooms and what's the frequency of uh, use of the room itself and how many people are in the meetings. But but the the fundamental idea is everything Logitech does ought to be so simple that you know you're really your mom can help set it up. And it's not always we're still improving, but generally we're we're pretty easy to set up and use. Right. Um, so you hit on a lot of things there. Um, the Dancing with Startups program that I run, uh, a lot of companies look at different ways to to do what you just said. So one we recommend is embedding entrepreneurs inside the company. You're doing that. Another one is to um, kind of separate from the mothership, setting up separate operations in other places. My guess is you've done that, whether they're labs or just a you know bunch of people. Yep. Um, under the partnering scenario, we usually figure out ways to partner with the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And that is usually not geographic based, it's capability based or people or technology. So it's global. It's not easy to do. It's, it's, you know, for, for big companies to, uh, to kind of make uh, headway in, but it's, it's very much anti-culture. So there's problems with all three of those, obviously bringing entrepreneurs in the core people sometimes feel a little, a little jealous having been one. I, I used to get things thrown at me occasionally because I, I would get funding. I would get funding to come up with the new cable modem. That, we invented or a fiber optic cable TV back in the Antec yeah. Eris days. Um, not everyone was happy with that. Um, and you seem to handle that very well from a leadership perspective. So I wanted to get some insight onto that, and then we can move to kind of borrowing and partnering, see how you guys do that. That'd be awesome. Okay. Well, we we do bring entrepreneurs inside, and uh, and we and but we do we don't only we we the emphasis is more on small teams than it is just on bringing entrepreneurs inside. Uh, you know, so we've. Right. Uh, we generally try to give people a lot of accountability, a lot of ownership. You know, when we survey our people, which we just did our first real engagement survey ever, it was it was really impressive how how much people felt like they could do what they thought they wanted to do or needed to do for their business and, and felt unencumbered by that. So and and that comes with this structure because you know if you have thirty different businesses and one CEO and a flat organization, I have twenty four direct reports. I'm wow. not going to get in the weeds on most of those things. I, I'm going to, uh, they're, they're going to have to run it. I always say this, I don't run this company. It really runs, the company runs and I have a job here and my job is different from other people's jobs, but everybody has a job. So it's a very, um, it's a very independent place where people can run their own things. And it's, it's an exciting place to work. There's a lot of change all the time. We're super agile because of that and fast. And, uh, and I think that's attractive to people who, if they either had their startup and they said, yeah, I want, I'd like a little more uh, consistency than, than having my own startup and having all that nightmares, exactly. late night sweats and things. <laughs> I'd like to have more, but, but I love the independence and the creation and the, the whole process of ownership. And that so, is the perfect, perfect blend, especially if you're married or something. It's like, it makes the household a lot happier too. The struggling, <laughs> the struggling entrepreneur is a tough, it's a tough zone. It's tough. Yeah. It's so a, that's a great culture. 24 direct reports. You have to leave them alone. So they, I bet most of them appreciate that. Um, yeah. The a very, very different culture, like from Apple, where it's like, yeah. like tell, tell me what you're doing every Monday morning. I want to, you know, all that stuff is, I mean, it's a culture thing. It's a, it's a, yeah. so talk about, um, so that's kind of stuff you can bring in control. Um, what about partnering with things that you don't, that don't report to you, that don't work for you, that you don't own, you haven't acquired. Um, have you done much yeah. in that category? Yeah, a lot. I mean, we're, we we think of ourselves, but if you look at the 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 original Logitech was an OEM manufacturer for big players like Apple, oh, um, that's like right. Dell, like so so because of that, we've always we've always viewed it, and we're Swiss, you know, and we're used to playing with everybody in who all those people operate in the same field, and we just so we we, we view ourselves, and you'll like the analogy, maybe we, I view myself as as a, as a as a company that that of a we're a little mouse, and we run around the feet of all the elephants, and nobody minds us, and in fact. We're a harmless, capable partner to all, most of them. So, so those big platform players that provide all kinds of services, and you know, we really partner with them. We love them. And uh, you know, Apple, for example, has been. You know, we've just been. We've really enjoyed a great uh, relationship with them. They, they don't tell us anything that they don't tell you on the outside. We're, we've occasionally had a secret project or two, but generally they don't. But, but they know that we're going to deliver the. We're going to try to deliver really a great experience with their their platforms, and we try to do the same thing with everybody. And so I'd say the primary place we really borrow or really support is other people's platforms. We love that. We, we create our own too, but, but I'd say more rarely. We, we think yeah. of ourselves as a peripheral to, to any, somebody else's cloud. We have our own services on top of that that will go, you know, mm -hmm. like Streamlabs or, or a, the service we have on, on our video equipment now, or we'll offer extended warranty and setup and things like that. But generally, we want to be here to help these big platforms be successful with their customers. 
You know, that's, that's uh, actually really smart because you just basically ride that wave with them rather than competing with them. It's, I don't know if you knew this, but the elephant and the mouse were the two characters in Dancing with Startups. And I know <laughs> I normally would classify you as the elephant, but against <laughs> Apple, you are the nimble mouse or some people call it, some yeah. people call it an ir irritating chipmunk. It can be sometimes as well. Yeah. So that's interesting where, you know, a $3 billion company can actually be the agile player to help some of the even larger players. We call those guys BFSs. So big, fat and slow needs <laughs> that capability to be plugged. If you're actually both at the same time, we are big, fat fascinating and slow. right here, right now. We're a big, fat uh, and slow in too many places. No, that's good. That's good. Though. You, I mean, the way you've broken it down is smart. How about, uh, I know a lot of listeners are asking, got a couple of questions coming in here about um, the whole work at home, digital acceleration. We've covered on this program, so I won't do it again. Just how much digital acceptance has accelerated in the household, in the work, in shopping, in gaming. Gaming was already there. But, um, you know, how it's actually accelerated by anywhere from five to 10 years. Even the laggard baby boomers, friends of ours, right? Um, <laughs> Even they are, they're like, oh yeah, I'm so hip now. I'm using all the digital stuff and I shop and I do this. So that is transforming retail. But I thought I'd get your thoughts on the whole work at home trend. What's going on? What do you, what do you think is going to happen there? Yeah, I, you know, uh, you know, when I mentioned those secular trends that drive our business, you know, uh, esports, mm -hmm. or work from anywhere, personal streaming, the democratization of content creation where everybody can create some content and put it out there. Uh, and then, of course, video everywhere. All of those are have been on this long, long-term rise that we've been riding behind. All of them got this big acceleration, like like somebody just turned on the fan behind the sales, and and, uh, and very rapidly. So, uh, in in every case, you know, I think you're seeing more and more of that. I don't think we're ever going to go back to. I know we're not going to go back to where we were for a work from home standpoint. You know, people are getting a better setup at home. People are kind of creating their own broadcast studios. They can do something a little bit like you're doing, probably for a really a, somewhat, a little bit smaller audience. Uh, but but this is this is the trend that's happening, and the, I think it's 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 going to continue for the very long term. It's probably also going to give a there, you know there are secondary effects to all this stuff. I think one of them that I'm I think is fascinating is the gig economy. I think the gig gig world is just going to explode here in about a year right. or two because exactly. more, more and more people are going to be working from home and they're going to say, you know what, there's something else I can kind of do from here. And then they're going to make the transition out of their old job or, or keep it and do a little bit of gigging. And then companies are going to say, wait a minute, I got, I got already got all these people working from home. This next job I need to add, why don't I add it gig style? I'll, I'll use a part of somebody's time, not all of it. And so the gig world is going to, I think it's going to just keep on growing and maybe accelerate over, over time kind of a, an asymptotic curve. No, I agree. I just did a lecture with the Kellogg students about that. It's just like, it's finding your purpose in the gig economy. And I, I made fun of a couple articles, which I always do. I kind of show them on the screen and it's like people are were saying, yeah. no, they weren't yours. They were the demise of the gig economy. And I said, don't read this. It's not completely <laughs> accurate. I mean, not at all. I'm like, I'm like, no, half of you who think you're going into corporate and consulting world are either going to work for a startup um, or have a gig economy job with your corporate job. And that's fine. That's, and here's how you do it. It's like a whole Great. new one that's of the things. Awesome. So that's good. Esports. I'm a huge fan of you guys were one of the first ones in there. You took a gamble. You started sponsoring people were like, what is esports? And you got it. Um, are you still riding that wave, obviously. Oh, Big time. It's just, it's one of the most exciting things we've done. We've got a lot of exciting things going on. But if you make exciting. high performance gamer keyboards, some people don't know that gamers need keyboards. Um, oh, it's not just, yeah. it's not joysticks and everything like it used to be. It's all types of sophistication and headsets That's and right. cameras and audio and audio is important. Absolutely. Big, big curved screens like mine. And yeah. um, absolutely. so you, in terms of, you know, what you see next and, you know, expanding on those three cylinders that you covered, which, which ones are you more excited about than, um, like over the next five years or so? It's a tough question, I know. You know, you know it, it is a tough question because because uh, we're very fortunate. I'm really, uh, you know, it's like asking me which of my children do I like the most, you know. And I you have three of those too, so. <laughs> I've got four of them. I've got four, four. of them. Love them. Oh, no, I've got three of them. I'm just kidding. No, my, my kids are going to be alarmed. Where's the fourth job? Um, I, <laughs> I, uh, but, but, you know, I would say if I, if you really pin me up against the wall and say, which one are you most excited about? Um, I would not be able to answer officially. But mm -hmm. unofficially, I would say probably streaming and creating, which is yeah. the blue microphone, stream labs, webcams, whatever. And, and, and by the way, it also touches our mice and keyboards, this whole setup, because I really do envision a world where, you know, almost everybody is, is, is creating content and putting it out there for other people to see. It's already happening. And it's just going to keep growing and doing that when, and doing it where it's easy and looking good and feeling good and feeling confident and, and getting feedback. 
all those things are, are so important and being able to potentially make a living doing it, which you can do with Streamlabs. You know, we, we, I don't know if people know this, but Streamlabs, you can use to, to set yourself up, get merchandise for your followers, and you can stream, and we don't charge a thing for, for, for if, if people donate to you online, you know, with mm -hmm. tips and stuff, we don't take any of the money, it just all goes to you. So it's a, it's a, this is a world that I'm super excited about, and I love creativity, so I see so much creativity through Streamlabs and all the other businesses, so maybe the streaming and creating part, but it doesn't mean that I'm not almost maybe day in and day out, sometimes more, even more excited about esports or video everywhere or, or even working from home. Yeah, and, and, and streaming fits into all those categories anyway. Content, does, content, really creation, content creation is everywhere, and I, I don't know yeah. how we can build enough servers to store all this stuff, actually. I, I'm always amazed about that. I so think that's the real reason. The Bezos hardware business gotten, is not dead, guys. It's, no, I think that's the real reason Bezos has gotten into you know, Virgin Galactic, because he's going to have to put servers in space. There's just no more space for a server. <laughs> uh, there's one outside my window right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I uh, really appreciate you you being on, and uh, next time we'll we'll come out and do this at your uh, at your HQ, um, or maybe in, maybe in, maybe in Switzerland. Who knows? But That'd be awesome. it's hard for you. Uh, I usually ask you what kind of parting words, words of wisdom, maybe something a little hopeful here for the audience. Uh, there's a work at home audience. There's a gamer audience here. There's there's people trying to figure out what they should do with their gig and where they should be streamers. But yeah, any any good parting words for the uh, for the users out there? You know, I guess I'll say one, you know, and, and I don't know when people are watching this, but but it, it, this is always relevant. You know, there's a lot of discussion today about and, and their protests and things about uh, they're really anti-racism and people have gotten preoccupied by the vandalism that's happening here and there. I, I hope people will be preoccupied by by the protests. This is a time where when I think for maybe for the first time in my lifetime, we have a chance to completely reverse this racism problem. And I am super excited about that. And there's such a gap between what we should be doing it day in and day out, including in companies like Logitech, where systemic racism and, and bias is built into the way we do things. And now is the time to really turn the tide. This is the biggest moment we've, in my lifetime to make that change. So I hope everybody will jump in and be, be an advocate and be a protester against racism and for getting the bias out. Yeah, I think for the first time you're seeing most of the Fortune 500 company CEOs actually coming out and making statements, and it's, it's, very, it's very different. Um, why do you think yep. that is? I think that I think people are getting educated. You know, these these shocking events where you know where where you know black people have been killed is the extreme horror story that's been going on for for hundreds of years, and it's it's not dissipating now, and. And I think everybody's sort of realizing that and not sort of, they are realizing it. And then I think once you realize that you dig deeper, you realize the, the systemic problems that, that our culture and our organization, uh, the way we do things has created. That's not may, maybe perpetuating that, although it is, but it's also perpetuating such an unfair playing field. And it's not just about black people. It's about so, all minorities. But the, 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 the frustration and, and horror stories that are happening in the black community to the black community um, are so extreme that they deserve to be focused on. You know, black lives do matter. And all lives do matter, but black lives matter. And the reason that term has come up is because of the mistreatment. And I think all, so many of us that are in leadership roles uh, missed it. You know, we just didn't quality get it. And uh, even though we thought we were good people, including me, and I tell you, I've got the religion now. Or they just thought it was it was getting better, and in you know, yeah. in, so, in some cases, in some companies, it is. It's, but yep. that's just one little company and one little place. So that's right. So the systemic nature of it is really what needs to be addressed. And public CEOs like you are, are a great place to be uh, supporting that. So I really want to. I really appreciate your efforts there, Bracken, and uh, really enjoyed having you on. And uh, look forward to seeing you soon. It's been so fun being on here. Thank you very very much. Now I'm gonna yeah. eat my oatmeal. Yeah, <laughs> sorry to keep you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, have a great day out there. Okay, see you now. Take care now. Bye.